Um, the fifth Sunday of Lent, I think, is that correct? Is it the fifth or is it the sixth? It's one week before Palm Sunday. Uh, and uh, a, a beautiful uh, respite from uh, what Southern Californians call winter. Um, uh, a special greeting to our friends from West Michigan this morning, the Vinsalcoma clan in town looking for their respite from uh, uh, that uh, season of the year that's in between. It's not really winter, except when you wake up and there's snow everywhere, but it's not really spring, except for you just saw the flowers uh, uh, up. Uh, but it is a beautiful time of year, seasonally, uh, and it's a beautiful time of year for the church as we spend time in Lent, as we reflect on um, God's uh, call to us, a reminder of our brokenness, and a, a wonderful reminder of God's provision, uh, His love and grace uh, to us. And so um, we as the church um, sit in that time of confession and of uh, declaration of pardon as we build towards Good Friday and Easter. And so here we are uh, this morning as the body of Christ uh, to be reminded of God's gift for us through the elements, through the Lord's Supper, through the Word, and as we bring our gifts and our words of prayer and praise. Will you stand for this call to worship as we uh, uh, talk to each other as uh, people and leader? The Lord says, this is from Jeremiah 31, the Lord says, I will make a new covenant with my people. He will put his law on our minds and write it on our hearts. The Lord says, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Come, let us worship the Lord of love together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your adopting us as sons and daughters, as your people, not because of our merits, but because of your great love. Thank you that we can be your people. We pray that you would hear our prayers, our praises, accept and use our gifts for your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hear this greeting of God. Uh, Paul writes to the church at Colossa and to us today, grace and peace to you from God our Father.
God's word for us and his will for our lives comes this morning from the book of Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23. You may be seated. Thanks, Brian. Proverbs uh, 4, verses 23 through 27. Here's God's will for our lives this morning. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk away from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Now, I'd like to just have a moment of silence that we can reflect on our sins and have a silent time of confession, and I will end with a brief prayer. Let's pray. Father, keep our mouths clean with the words that come out. Help us to have laser focus on the path you have set for us and help us to walk that straight path each and every day. Amen. And now a song of response. Please stand with us as we sing in Christ alone.
Is good news, my friends. Here is God's assurance for us this morning. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Hear the word of the Lord. Praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil or fade, Keep heaven for, kept in heaven for you, for who faith is shielded by God's power until the coming of his son. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, and it's uh, another opportunity for us to come together as God's people in prayer. I'm not going to be mentioning any names in the prayer this morning, but I am making an exception up front because it's so good to see Tony in the service after his surgery the middle of this week. And if there are others uh, that I miss, excuse me, but uh, wanted to make that mention. Will you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, the Gospels tell us that at the outset of your ministry, you called hearers to repent and believe the good news. As a congregation, we've just done that in confession and hearing words of assurance and pardon. So we continue in prayer with thankfulness. It's good to be gathered again. May your faithfulness prompt us to also be faithful. We want to thank you for blessings. Where do we start? They never end. So in each heart here this morning, we recall your goodness. We recall your kindness. We acknowledge your mercy. In the many and varied dimensions of our lives, we know that you as sovereign and saving Lord are with us. You are with us in life's highs and lows. Thank you for being our ever-present help in time of need. With the psalmist, we bring you our praises, our songs. We humbly and with some chagrin recognize that much of our prayer is petition. Even with the abundance of blessings we receive, we still have the tendency ask for more. Help us to find balance and contentment. May our lives reflect our dependence on you, and in that way, be a witness to a watching world. We live, Lord God, in a needy world. There too, where do we start? Hurt and suffering may be in our own families and lives, we also see it in so many other places. Be merciful, O God, to those who are experiencing disasters, war, hunger, violence. To that end, use neighbors, first responders, government and non-government agencies to alleviate, help, and restore. Use our offerings for disaster response and our denominational agency. And once again, we pray for authorities and officials at all levels of government. We pray, Lord, for justice as a manifestation of your love. Lord, right here in Crossroads Church, we pray you'll accompany and make fruitful the work and plans of the task forces of the Consul. We know that it is by the power of your Spirit that growth and blessing come. So we ask that the efforts and programs planned will serve your purposes to bless our lives, this congregation, and our community. Lord, we close this prayer this morning asking blessing on two pastors, 
on Pastor Jeff as he returns and serves as now our duly installed minister. We are thankful with and for him and his family. Be with them in this coming time. Bless also Pastor Roger as he speaks to us of your word. Give us ears to hear, hearts to hold, and wills to respond. And finally, Lord, now in this month of March madness, help us also be mindful that it continues to be Lent and to repent and to love the good news. Bless our lives in your service. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. That wasn't very convincing. I'm sorry. <laughs> good morning. There we go. That's a little better. Okay. Well, and thank you for the invitation to uh, bring the message this morning and lead you in worship. Um, I think most of you know who I am, but maybe some don't. So I'm Roger Boltman. I've been a CRC minister for since uh, 1974. This little paragraph on the bulletin, I think, that says that. My wife, Liz. We spend some uh, weeks and months, uh, actually a good three months this year in Southern California, because we have a uh, married daughter and some grandchildren here. Uh, Sarah Verhoeven is our daughter, and Ryan, and of course, and two of the kids are there. The third one is at Calvin University. And I think Sarah got wind of who was preaching, and so she's elsewhere today. <laughs> but uh, no, she's actually visiting a friend. So, so, uh, but it's good to be here, and I see uh, Pastor Jeff is here. And just so you know, I mean, this business of being a CRC minister is such a trauma that he hasn't been able to preach for three weeks. <laughs> but congratulations, Jeff. <laughs> and um, I'm sure you will be a blessing to the denomination, and hopefully we can be to you and, and, and you to this church as well. So, so uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. I'm nervous. I've talked to a couple of people about that. I haven't preached for a few months. Um, so uh, Vander, Vander, Van Sulkema said, that's like the first day of school in the fall. You know, you, you've been preaching for a dozen, you know, decades, but it's still, you know, so it's kind of like that way. So sorry about that. Anyway, let's turn to the Bible and um, see if uh, we can find out what God wants to say to us this morning. Okay. So here is the scripture. I got to make sure I get this all right. Then the Lord said to Mo, no, that's not where we want to go. Yeah, that is right. Oh, I saw 33 and I thought that was the verse. I thought, wait a minute. Chapter 33 of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I'll give it to your descendants. I'll send an angel before you, drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. Because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you're a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb or Sinai. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance 
while the Lord spoke with Moses. And whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. And Moses said to the Lord, You've been telling me, lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You've said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. Well, if you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to favor to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? That's as far as we'll read today. So um, I think we should bow in prayer a second. Lord, help us to uh, understand your word. We pray that you would tenderize our hearts so that you may speak into them and into our lives uh, in, in new ways, in fresh ways, in challenging ways, in comforting ways, as you always do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So at this time, I want to dismiss the kids to the arts table. Well, they already left. Yeah, okay. So they're already there. Thank you. So um, good, good. Okay, so... Um, For the, for the message today, the times were times of great uncertainty. So many things that seemed to have held things together in the past, it wasn't sure they'd hold things together going forward. So many people that you could once depend on, you weren't sure. No one was really clear about what the future might hold. It seemed to offer more uncertainty than promise. And the politics of the situation, well, they weren't very comforting and reassuring either. No one really knew. No one would really know, could really know or really knew in a, in a way that was in any way comforting or trusting what the future might hold. And that's always true. I mean, among the many things that we know absolutely nothing about, the future is one of them. Now, those few sentences, I suppose, could describe many times. Many times in our own nation's history. Maybe after the Civil War. Maybe after the Second World War. Maybe during the 60s. With all the upheaval for those of us who were around and can remember it. Maybe the time of Moses when he said this. If your presence does not go with us, don't send us up from here. Don't take us into any future if you don't go with us. You know some things about Moses, I'm sure. I'll recount them later, but just for now, this isn't Moses perplexed at the burning bush. I mean, a bush can burn and it's nothing uncommon, I would imagine. But that bush didn't burn up. It just kept burning. And so he went and listened. This isn't Moses genuinely self-effacing, saying to God when God asked him to lead his people out of Egypt, I don't talk very well. 
And so uh, God sent him a partner, gave him a partner, and, and Aaron, this isn't Moses who screwed up enough courage to go to, say, to, to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. This isn't Moses who um, was so obedient that when he was told to you know, get raw water from the rock, he did just as God had said. No, this is Moses troubled, really disturbed, bewildered, dismayed, even betrayed. So the question this morning is, would it be suitable or fitting for us to be in Moses' shoes? Are we in a similar situation? Can it be said of us that we face an uncertain, un, a problematic future? Can we take these words on our lips? If your present does not go with us, don't take us up from here. Well, let's ask, how did, how did we get to this place? Where are they and how did we get here? Well, this is the story of redemption, right? I mean, you could start at the creation of Adam and Eve in the image of God in a perfect world and the fall into sin, and then God undertakes some rescue plan, and it gets boots on the ground, really, in the call of Abraham in Genesis 12, where God calls Abraham out of the earth of the Chaldees and says, I'm going to make of you a people, and your descendants are going to be like the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore, and I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to prosper, man. And through you and your descendants, your children and their children and theirs and theirs, every nation on earth is going to be blessed. Genesis 15, 17, kind of move that along and of course you you know the story and then Joseph ends up in Egypt being sold by his brothers and there's a famine and his family comes down and and they're slaves there 400 years they're slaves in Egypt and then God calls Moses at the burning bush and says I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go and, you know, the residence that he had, the, the hesitation, but that was all worked out. And so he, he goes to Pharaoh, Moses does, says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, that's not going to happen, pal. And God sends these plagues, ten of them. I mean, the water turned to blood, the frogs, the gnats, the boils. The, and there's a tenth one that kind of topped them all. When the Israelites had to slaughter an animal and put the, paint the door frame with the blood, and the angel of death would kill every firstborn of, of human and animal in one night, but spare the Israelites because of the blood. Wow. And so... Moses, our uh, Pharaoh finally ch does change his mind and says, get out of here and take everything you want with you, man. We've had enough of this stuff. And so they go. But then Pharaoh changes his mind and chases them, and now they're backs against the Red Sea, and God parts the waters. And so they go through on dry land. You know the story. But Moses, our, if Pharaoh's still coming, what's going to happen? He can go through on dry land too, but No. The waters come together, the horsemen, the chariots perish in the water. And then they're journeying and they get grumpy. Funny, God's people are never grumpy these days, are they? I don't know. But they got grumpy and they were hungry and thirsty. And by miracle, God gave them water, manna. Well, now they're at the mountain. 
where God is going to meet with Moses and give the law. Because these folks, they had no idea how to run a country. They had been slaves for 400 years. God was going to give them the law, the Ten Commandments, and all the other laws, so they could organize themselves as a society and have some, some framework in which to begin to function. It was going to come from God, no, no less. And so God demonstrates, He manifests His glory, you know, on that mountain, Mount Horeb. There was smoke, there was, there was uh, thunder, there was fire, the mountain was trembling. And Moses, or God's giving His law to Moses. You know, I mean, the best day ever? This had to be the best day ever. For Moses. I mean, could you imagine a better day? And then it happened. Moses receives from God, he's got the tablets, he comes down the mountain, and he hears stuff. Something's going on. The people had made the golden calf. Moses is angry. A fit of rage. I mean, really. He smashed the tablets that he got from God. He burnt the calf, ground it to powder, threw it in the water, and made him drink it. And I don't think it was like, and now it would please me if you drank of the water. No, drink it, drink it! Maybe not that bad, but you get the point. It's a story in itself. <laughs> the golden calf. You know, you read how they did it, in chapter 32, Aaron said to them, Take off your gold earrings, what your, what your wives, your sons, your daughters are wearing. Bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him, and he made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, these are the gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. So Moses confronts Aaron in chapter 32, and he says, he said to Aaron, what, what did these people do? How did they get you to do this? And in verse 22 of chapter 32, don't be angry, my Lord, Aaron says to Moses, you know how prone these people are to do evil? They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. Because Moses took too long, 40 days. Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Like a thoroughly modern man, like the victim, right? I didn't do anything. Moses, betrayed. This was the pal that God gave him to speak for Moses when he couldn't speak well. And then Moses, so that's how they got here. And Moses goes to that tent of meeting, and he prays. He intercedes. He's only a second-rate mediator. He can't get it done. Only Christ can do that. There's only one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen? But he says, and we didn't read that part, but if you blot me out of your book so that they can be good with you, I'll do that. But God said, no, 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 no. That's not going to happen. God says, you know what? 
I'll go with you. I mean, I'll, I'll take you into the land. That's we, not this verse, but an earlier one. I'll take you into the land, but my presence will not go with you. And that's when Moses says, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. I don't know if it's possible to imagine how desperate this prayer is. Everything was on the line. The promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The covenant, the agreement, I'll be your God, you be my people. For God to say, I'll take you into that land of milk and honey, but my presence, no. It's like Moses saying, if you don't go with us, what good is milk and honey? What good is prosperity without you, God? We'll be secular. We need something transcendent to make life good. We don't know how to be a people. We've been slaves for 400 years. We need your laws, your guidance, and there are a whole bunch of them in the Old Testament, as you know, to give order and structure and unity and, and health and, and prosperity to their world in that new land. And for God to say, I'll drive all the people out. You can have all the milk and honey you want. You just don't have me. Oh, Moses, angry, panicked, betrayed, desperate, undone, broken. If your presence doesn't go with us. Well, so let's say we're standing in his shoes. and looking at our own future. Kind of interesting, this culture we live in, this land that we live in, that God has put us in. A few years ago, a couple years ago, Harvard hired a new chaplain. They have many chaplains. I read 40 or something, a big, big college, big university. And you think, oh, good, 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 chaplain. This is the lead chaplain, like the president of their chaplains. The only thing is, he's an atheist. Now, I, that might just be the right thing for Harvard. I mean, they're diverse, right? They got Sikhs and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and Christians and Jews and atheists and agnostics. I guess 40% of the student body is either atheist or agnostic. So it might be right for them. I'm just saying as a window into the culture. Do you know that there are now churches, I guess they're really kind of churches, that are organized without God? They get together, they sing, they eat, they hire somebody to give a talk on a topic of human interest. They don't do very well for very long because, well, there's not a whole lot of reason to get together. But that's a window into the culture. You, I, we live in a culture where um, there's a prominent author in another Christian denomination who advocates for um, ethically sourced porn. Ethically sourced porn. No shame in using porn. It's fine. But just make sure it's ethically sourced. Oh, like, you know, get your eggs from free-range chickens and uh, buy your fair trade coffee. I can't get there. The coffee and the eggs fine, but not the ethically sourced. Just make sure it's ethically sourced and, and you're fine. There's another um, denomination, not ours, that has a ministerial candidate who is a drag queen. I don't know. 
that's your culture. I think, God, if your presence does not go with us, we have not a clue how to make this work. And I didn't mention, you know, the, the daily things that you and I face just as people. Like, how am I going to make my family work? How am I going to make sure my marriage isn't just another statistic? How am I going to see to it that my kids don't grow up, uh, grow up in a, uh, a phone-based, uh, phone-based uh, childhood? How are we going to teach them when they are our children, when they're under so many influences in, in school, how are we going to be an influence in whatever school we're in? If your presence does not go with us. And you know, some of us here, and I suppose I have to uh, almost count myself among them, some of us here, when we think of the future, we are very well aware that we have a whole lot more past than we have future. Right? I mean, the past is like this long, and the future is... <laughs> right? I don't know, maybe this long. And we know, if your presence does not go with us, don't send us up from here. Well, what is that presence? Well, I guess for Moses, it was so many things, right? The, 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 the basket in the Nile, right, where he was kind of rescued from, the bush, the, the, the plagues, the, 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 the manna, the, the quail, the water, the, the, the mountain, I mean, it was just a part of his life for so much of the time. What is it for us? The presence of God? It's word. It's the spirit that, you know, John, or Jesus uh, talks about in the Gospel of John when he says, oh, I, Jesus Christ, will send you my spirit, the spirit of truth, guide you into all the truth. It's worship. It's community. It's sacrament. It's Jesus who said, when he sent out his disciples in Matthew 28, I will be with you. Always, even to the end of the age. Oh, let's take this prayer. Let's put on Moses' shoes and say, here we sit in church. If your presence doesn't go with us, We won't know what to do. We don't even want to go there. That should be our prayer. So, if we... Well, let me, let me just say this. When... I, I forgot to say it, actually. When Moses utters his prayer in this desperate, you know, betrayed, angry, you know, dis, uh, broken state... You know, he's, you have to believe he is, he is stark raving serious about God right then. This is not anything, there's nothing of this magnitude anywhere else for Moses. Nor should it be for us. So if we were to be stark raving serious about praying this prayer... What changes might, imagine what changes might, might you be prompted to make in your life? How might it influence the way you engage that difficult neighbor? 
how, how, might, the, how might some new rhythms and, um, and routines come into your, into your life and maybe your family that have been kind of discarded because, oh, the pressures, the, 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 the work, the commitments, and so, that have disrupted what, what we all know really ought to be the case if we're going to really be stark raving serious. What kind of student would I be if I prayed this prayer before I went to school every day? What kind of boss would I be when I decided how much to pay my employees? My employees? What kind of spouse would I be? What kind of church member would I be? God, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not send us up from here. It's a challenging culture. Aaron Wren has written uh, that um, he kind of divides recent history now in terms of uh, our culture's relationship to the church into three parts. And these dates are, I don't know where he gets them exactly from, maybe they can be flexed, but three, three stages. Prior to 1994, so he says, the, the, the culture was favorable toward the church. It was a plus to be a church member. Uh, church was an asset to a community. They taught good values. They, you know, they, they taught decency and respect and so forth. Then from 94 to 04, and I, I don't know if these, you can argue with these dates, feel free. 94 to 04, neutral. Neutral. Yeah, they can be there. They're no harm to anybody. Not much good either, maybe, but kind of neutral. And then after uh, 04 to the present, um, church is a negative. Churches are viewed, Christians are viewed as a threat to the mainstream norms within our culture. That's how a lot of folks in our culture look at you and I. And that's where we live as God's people. One way to think about this, I think, is, is to, uh, well, let me put it this way. Uh, uh, churches, not so much anymore when they're built, but churches always had steeples, right? Always had steeples. And you can read and find out, like, why did they have steeples? Well, because they were the, wanted to be the tallest building in town, uh, because maybe they had to house a, a clock or a bell. Um, or, or also, they kind of pointed up up toward heaven, you know, just to kind of remind anybody who could see that, you know what, there's a God you really need to deal with in one way or the other. So it was like, there's more to life than what's on the ground. So I like to refer to God's people, Christians, as steeple people. People that know to the bottom of their heart and with all of their mind and soul that there's more to life than what's on the ground. We live with one eye toward heaven and the other toward the things of the earth. Don't ever let either of them close. Oh, steeple people. Pray the prayer of Moses. If your presence doesn't go with us, don't take us up from here. Don't take us out of this building this morning or anywhere. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, the challenges uh, your word gives us, for the comfort it brings. The, the Israelites gathered around the, the mountain. They had to stay away because uh, there was a, a great manifestation of your greatness and your glory. We don't see that type of demonstration today of your glory. But we see one even better than, you know, thunder that only lasts a few seconds and 
smoke and fire that goes away. We see your glory, know your glory in the cross. The glory that we're going to draw near to as we partake of the sacrament. The glory of your only Son, who in the Gospel of John chapter 1, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory like the Son of the Father. Send us on your way with your presence today. Enable us to draw near with sincerity to the elements that we are about to partake and receive your glory, your love, truth, and grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We, uh, every, oh, I'm sorry, we do a song right now, don't we? Go for it. Please stand with us and sing, Be Thou My Vision. Good morning. Good morning. For the month of March, our deacons chose World Renew, specifically disaster relief, as our special cause to support. <clears throat> Several disasters have happened recently around the world. In February, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake, followed hours later by a 7.5 magnitude earthquake, hit southern Turkey and northern Syria. 
48,000 people were killed and survivors struggled in freezing conditions with millions displaced as buildings and homes were destroyed. World Renew has been providing emergency food assistance, blankets, clothing, hygiene kits, and other help. Recently, the longest lasting and most traveled tropical cyclone ever recorded, Cyclone Freddy, affected Malawi, Mozambique, and Madagascar, leaving many without adequate food, shelter, and water. World Renew's staff and partners responded to the many families left homeless, helping them to find shelter and providing much needed emergency supplies. Please continue to hold these crisis affected families in your prayers, as well as the World Renew staff and partners as they respond. You can find out more about um, World Renew at worldrenew.net and on the Deacon Bulletin board out in the church foyer. Thank you for sharing Christ's hope through your gifts and prayers. We now have a very short video presentation on the destruction in Turkey and Syria. And then the deacons and ushers will come forward to take the offering. During the season of Lent uh, at Crossroads, we uh, celebrate uh, Holy Communion, the sacrament, each week. And so we will do that again this morning. And uh, how we do that, I just want to uh, invite everyone to partake, but ask you first that you, you think about some things. Namely, um, uh, we ask that you understand that before God, uh, you're not a perfect person. We're all sinners, and, and, and you are but that God has sent his son Jesus Christ and by his death on the cross paid the price for sins and that you believe that he paid that price for you. And that you're going to spend the rest of your days here on this planet, on this earth, figuring out how to follow him and figuring out how to do that better and be more like him. Now, if, if, you're that, that's, if that's you, I'm a sinner saved by Jesus' blood on the cross and I'm working as best I know how and as God gives me the effort the energy and the enabling to do it, to follow him, to be more like him. If that's one of, if you're one of those folks, you can come and join us. Please do, whether you're a member or guest at the, at the table here today. Now, uh, there's gluten-free uh, bread in the middle. And um, having said that, may I uh, invite the uh, elders to come forward, please.
I'd ask that you join me in a word of prayer as we, you know, and, and, and then God, I said, was uh, stark raving, uh, raving. We should be stark raving uh, serious about God, and, and this, this, this is the proof that God is stark raving serious about us and about having a relationship with us and being in fellowship with us. Th- this is the remembrance that he paid the price on the cross to free us of sin. Not perfect, it doesn't make us perfect, but cleansed so that we can stand before God and uh, enjoy him forever. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the sacrament, uh, for this sign and seal of, uh, of uh, Jesus' blood of the covenant. And even though the covenant of the Old Testament was trashed so many times by the disobedience of, God's, of your people, Christ came and he paid the price. He lived the perfect life. This is his blood of the covenant that we remember. Help us to come and be blessed and be nourished spiritually as we partake today. In Jesus' name, amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And after the supper, he took a cup, and he blessed it, and he gave thanks, and he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for a complete forgiveness of all their sins. The way we do this is that we ask you to uh, come forward, come down the, uh, the two aisles to that one and that one over there, and uh, partake, and then be seated and, per- and uh, partake the elements as you wish. Please come.
please stand if you would. So <clears throat> I'm going to break the pattern a little bit because what are you going to do, fire me? I mean, <laughs> so, you know, it was fun to uh, have, uh, you know, Ted Mulder and the boys here because I, in Redlands, I, you know, uh, Jake and Alice were members of my church in Redlands. Great to see minister to Ted and the boys and um, Grace and Clancy lapping his uh, daughter. And I can, I just have this thing, you know, I'm 75 next month. I just, names just kind of go away. Huh? Well, uh, Glenda, Glenda Vanderkamp had her parents in, in Redlands. So it's kind of fun to see the generational force of God's grace. You know, it's really neat. So I'm going to um, give the summary of the law. And then I'm going to say, get it. And I want you to say, got it. Okay? Because, I mean, Jesus made it really simple, folks. Love God and love your neighbor, right? So he was asked, what are the great commandments? And he says, let me put it in a way that everybody can understand. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And there's another one that's just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The God above you, the people around you, steeple people, you get it? Good. Good. And let's go do that. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you his peace. Amen.